Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 141. Well, I'm just back from Odessa, Texas, where I presented a full day seminar at the Permian Basin Genealogical Society, and I got to enjoy a big dose of Texas hospitality and had an absolutely wonderful time. Although there was a bit of a bumpy start, when when the president of the society met me at the airport, we were standing there waiting for my luggage. And he was asking me about my travels and asked me if I had ever lost any luggage. And I said, no, um, I've been very fortunate. I've never had a problem. We continued to watch the baggage conveyor belt for my red suitcase. And we continued to chat only to realize that we were the only ones left standing at the baggage claim. And it became painfully apparent that my little red bag wasn't going to appear. And sure enough, it was lost somewhere between Oakland, Las Vegas, and Midland, Texas. So the main lesson of this story is never talk about whether you've ever lost luggage. (laughs) It just jinxes the whole thing. And then it was very interesting to, of course, have a full day seminar ahead of me the next day with only what I had in my rolling carry-on bag. Now, I've traveled enough to know that anything essential to my presentation, of course, gets carried on to the plane on my person. Um, So I was okay in that respect, but I had to hit the mall. I know, ladies, it was such a hardship, but I had to hit the mall that evening and go find something to wear. So did some speed shopping and uh, everything was okay. But once we got over that little hiccup, the society board members really kicked the weekend off by taking care of some very important additional business introducing me to fried catfish. We went to Mama's Restaurant in Odessa, Texas. And let me just tell you that I am a complete catfish convert. That was one of the yummiest meals that I've had in a long time. Now, out here on the West Coast, you don't come across catfish. It's it's pretty much fish and chips made with cod um, with a beer batter crust on it. But catfish gave that a run for its money. And as soon as I get done traveling, my, my schedule is going to s- quiet down a little bit once we get into the holiday season in November. I am going to see if I can't uh, find a store around here that carries catfish and try my hand at making some of that for my family. Now, at the seminar on Saturday, I presented four topics uh, with ultimate Google search strategies, Google Earth for genealogy, how to find your family history in newspapers, and we did podcast and blogs 101. And Everyone seemed to have a lot of fun. They were all buzzing about what they had learned and what they were going to go home and try first. And I love hearing that because I really want folks to walk away with stuff that they can use right away and that will make them more successful and have more fun with their family research. So that was cool. And yes, the great food continued. I mean, these people really know how to cook. Uh, They had a spread a mile long during the breaks of goodies made with love by the members. Oh, my gosh, they were so good. And and an awesome barbecue lunch. So needless to say, I am heading straight to the gym when I get done recording this episode. (laughs) Um, But I want to thank Bob Gordon of Books and Things and David Hess, who's president of the Permian Basin Genealogical Society, for bringing me out. And I hope to see you all out there in Odessa again in the future. Uh, Next up, I am heading to Kelowna, British Columbia, for the Kelowna and District Genealogical Society Harvest Your Family Tree 2012 conference, where I again will be doing four presentations as well as a uh, Meet the Speakers panel at the banquet the first night. I'm really excited because Bill is going to be coming with me this time around. Um, He's going to be running my booth in the exhibit hall. So if you are attending the conference, be sure and go by and say hi to, to Bill as well. He'll be there. Okay, well, in this episode, we're going to have some fun going behind the scenes of a very popular and long-running PBS TV series, The Antiques Roadshow. Diane Haddad, Managing Editor of Family Tree Magazine, is going to be here to share how she slipped behind the curtain when the roadshow came to Cincinnati, which is, of course, also the home of Family Tree Magazine. 
But first, we're going to hear from you, and we're going to do that over at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter from that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me all the time Bring me a letter from my proud old dad we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. Okay, first up here in the mailbox is a, an email from Kathy. She says, I have a quick question. I subscribe to Family Tree Magazine. Can I download my print subscription to my iPad, as you can with other subscriptions? Or do I need to pay for each issue that I download? And she says, Family Chart Masters helped me with my Family Tree chart. It was beautiful and was a hit at our family reunion. Janet was so helpful. Thank you for the recommendation. Love your podcasts. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, let's see here. The Family Tree Magazine digital subscription is separate from the print subscription, unless you have a VIP subscription to Family Tree Magazine. So you can either purchase individual digital issues that you can download from the shop Family Tree store, or you can purchase a separate annual digital subscription. Um, I think they keep it separate because not everybody wants both kinds. Some people just want paper. Some people just want digital. And I do have a $10 off coupon on my website for Shop Family Tree because um, we are an affiliate of Shop Family Tree, which, which just means if you purchase anything through our link, if you get to their site from our link, then you're helping to support the free podcast. So that's always nice. We appreciate that. And I'll have that link for everybody in the show notes. And of course, if you have the free Genealogy Gems toolbar, just click the shop button and select support the podcast shopping links and you'll find several links and any specials that we have um, that they've made available to us to pass on to you. Those will be there um, and you can get that free Genealogy Gems toolbar on our homepage. Just scroll down on the homepage, you'll find it there in the bottom left hand corner. And Family Chart Masters, they do a wonderful job. I'm really glad. I, I knew that Janet would be of great help to you. She's so wonderful about um, helping you to really customize and make sure that the family tree chart that you're creating is the one that you want. So I'm really thrilled that that worked out. I also got an email from Mary in Iowa. Now, um, she writes in to say that podcast number 139 in that podcast episode, Ricky had asked about a successor to the Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness website. And she says there are actually three Facebook groups, not pages, but Facebook groups, carrying on the task of looking up genealogy information and other requests. So they're called R-A-O-G-K for Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness. And then there's R-A-O-G-K-USA and R-A-O-G-K dash international. Uh, you need to be a member of the Facebook group to post a message or request, but um, most requests for membership are granted very quickly. She says there are also two new websites that might help. Generous Genealogists at generousgenealogists.com, and genealogist is plural, and Gen Gathering at gengathering.com. Mary says, I think this is evidence that genealogists are some of the most sharing and generous people. We all seem to want to help each other. <laughs> it's so true. And um, if you are a member on Facebook and you want to check out one of those groups, just go up to the search box at the top of Facebook and type in RAOGK-USA or whichever one you want to be a part of. And I think with the groups, you will see a little button saying that you'd like to join the group. You click that 
and it will send information to the group and then they um, grant your request and have you become a member so that you can start posting. Thanks so much for passing that along, Mary. And let's see here, Scott from Oakland, Maine. He says, I'm in need of some advice regarding an uncooperative family member. (laughs) Oh, Scott, you're the only one with an uncooperative family member. No, (laughs) we all have them. He says, my father's brother wants nothing to do with our family. And in years past, once referred to himself as the black sheep. He has absolutely no interest in genealogy and is not willing at all to be a part of the family story that I'm putting together. My question is, how do I reference this character in my tree? My great-grandfather did a brief family genealogy in 1978, and he, my bitter uncle, was included. Since then, he changed careers and has remarried. He has two children, whom I have never met, and I understand he is estranged from them. So I guess my real question is, do I skip this guy and his marriages and children altogether, even though all the records can be found by any one of the Department of Vital Statistics? Another option would be to include him, but only write the most basic information. I know that he will be furious if he finds out that he is in the genealogy and family story, but I don't feel right not mentioning him and making believe he doesn't exist. Any advice you can give me would be most helpful. Well, of course, I imagine every family has a tough nut on a branch of the family tree. What I would do, Scott, is... If it were me, I would go ahead and include data on him in my private, personal family genealogy documents. And, of course, as you were talking about, you could really limit how much you're putting in there. It could just be the basics, the things that are verifiable through public records on birth and marriage and that type of thing. On trees and other information, of course, that you make public, like an online family tree at Ancestry, Of course, I would list him and his immediate family only as living. No names, no nothing, just that there's a living relative, that this this relative married somebody, that person's living, they have children, those people are living. And of course, you could determine whether, you could also indicate whether they're male or female. But in the end, I think each of us really has to evaluate the dynamics in the family and of course, see what seems right to you. You never know. People could come around, and and, uh, later he may be interested. Who knows? Maybe not. But I don't think that we really have to deny reality in terms of um, what's out there, what's publicly available. You're not disclosing anything that isn't easily available to anybody uh, online. So I hope that helps. Sorry to hear about that, but you know what? We all have those. (laughs) It's so true. I could tell you stories. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, From Glenn, just wanted to say a quick thanks for both podcasts you produce, Genealogy Gems and Family History Made Easy. He says, I've only just started that one from the beginning, so maybe the answers are in later episodes. Being Australian, I know I have to make allowances for the U.S. slant on your shows. Yep, because I live in the U.S. (laughs) He says, especially recently with your 1940s census release and indexing. I've been interested in the family history for some time and have been updating the tree sporadically, usually when a new occurrence happens, death, marriage, or birth. Recently, my interest has arisen again. Of course, I've made classic mistakes in not documenting everything and just collecting names, dates, and so forth. So in the last six months, I've been citing sources and updating the database. Yay! Good job. (laughs) You are on the right track. He says, one of the quandaries I have is, when do you stop? Not so much vertically, but how wide do you go in relation to cousins, second cousins, and family? Probably the main question I have is trying to decide whether to get a subscription to Ancestry.com or not. I feel I'm at that stage where online documents will help out in filling in the leaves of my branches. It could also break a few barriers I have in overseas records, Irish, English roots mainly. Well, Glenn, this is a great question. And I think, again, isn't it interesting? There are some things that really fall in the category. We all need to do these things, as in citing your sources. You're spot on with that. And, of course, that's critical. And we don't want anybody skipping that step. But then when it comes to the idea of the context that you're including and and how many branches you're including, 
that's really a personal choice. And let's face it, it's also a time choice, how much time we really have to do this. You know, if your time is very limited, then you might want to stay more focused on direct lines. But what you'll find is, at some point, you're going to run into brick walls. Yep, they're out there. We all find them. (laughs) And really, that is where the extended family can really come in handy. It's called cluster research. Oftentimes, we're doing reverse genealogy as well, where we have to kind of go back up the tree, go a little sideways into the cluster of relatives, head back again, and see if some of the lines connect. And of course, cluster genealogy and reverse genealogy are things we've talked about here on the podcast. So the thing is, if you come across these folks, I would go ahead and put them in the database, make note of them, make note of where additional information is available. Maybe you're not going to chase down that line right now, but you do have those clues, you do have those breadcrumbs that you've um, set in there of things that you've come across so that if down the road, you really do get stuck and you do need to kind of move sideways. And an example of this would be, perhaps you have a uh, distant cousin who passes away and that cousin's obituary lists all kinds of living relatives and people who attended the funeral. And sure enough, there is somebody in that list who you've been looking for. And they went because they were related. And that may give you the clue that you need to get back on track with that ancestor or that person who's really in your direct line. So again, it's a personal choice. Same thing with how much do we look at? In fact, when I was flying home from um, Odessa this weekend, I was sitting next to a lady and we were talking and she asked me what I did for a living and I told her about family history. And she was talking about a relative who does family history research in her family. Uh, In fact, I think, now that I think about it, it was her sister. So her sister had done quite a bit of research And she was really getting into these Civil War records and getting into how much money did he get in his pension and that kind of thing. And she says she was really frustrated. She says, because, I mean, she says, who cares how much money this guy was making from, you know, 150 years ago or whatever. She says, "Uh, my sister is a really, really talented artist and she has cancer And we don't know how long we're going to have her. And she says, I just wish she'd forget about that stuff. It doesn't matter. And sit down and paint because that's what she does and leave her legacy. And I think that that's a really interesting way to look at it. Of course, I'm focused on family history all the time, right? And that's my whole profession. And so it's easy to get focused on some of the minutiae minutia we call it sometimes we call it amazing gems things that we do happy dances when we find but it made me really kind of go back to that idea that it's really where you're at where you are at as a personal researcher and why you're doing it and who you're doing it for and what it means to you maybe for her that gives her a great amount of security and sense of belonging as she faces her possible end of life And that looking at the ancestors' information and and getting those kinds of details and really feeling connected to her family, maybe that's important to her. But on the other hand, I could really, really appreciate the viewpoint of the sister that I was talking to saying, ah, her talent is one in a million. It's unique to her. It's priceless to us. and, And I wish she was creating more of it so we'd have it to remember her by. So it becomes a delicate dance, doesn't it? A a balance of how we spend our time. Many people who ask about my work and and what I'm doing, um, they can tell that I spend a lot of time doing this, a lot of time traveling. I love every minute of it. But I make it clear that if uh, my daughter calls up and I hear little Davey on the other end of the phone, hi, Shasha, boom, it's done. (laughs) It's dropped. And I get my purse and I get in my car and I head up there. I'll bring my computer with me. And when he goes down for a nap, you know, we'll sit on the couch and watch some TV and I'll be working on, you know, items for the blog or the website or whatever. But it's a balance. And I'm very, very clear. In fact, I have a little sticky note on my computer that says my family, my husband and my children and my grandchildren come first, period, full stop. And that's the way I want it. But we're all different, and we're all definitely doing this for different purposes and different needs. And let's be honest, 
a lot of times there's an emotional need. Uh, there's an emotional gap that our family history research fills for us. And that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so not to get too heavy about it, but what I want to assure you, Glenn, and all the rest of you listening, is that um, you decide what's important to you. You decide the balance. This is your family history. And the good news is, is there's generations coming up behind you. And funny thing, the way it works, there's always somebody, just one even, in each generation who seems to catch the bug. And they seem to get it. And don't worry, they'll fill in some of that story for you if you don't get to it. So do what works for you. And just remember that some of those little breadcrumbs that you leave, those little tidbits of people that you're finding, if you make note of them now, just briefly even, you'll have them to turn back to when you do hit that brick wall. And as for Ancestry, you were asking, do I go ahead and invest in a subscription to Ancestry or not? I would say if you are kind of ready for those additional records and particularly looking overseas, my goodness, a subscription to Ancestry is going to be far more cost effective than writing individual letters, paying for individual documents, traveling to go places, and you're going to do it a lot faster. <laughs> so I can say that I've never regretted having my Ancestry.com um, membership. I'm not an affiliate of Ancestry, but I can tell you that it's a it's a great service. Can't imagine how you wouldn't be just thrilled as a genealogist to discover the documents that are available there on their website. And of course, they I believe they always have a free trial. So go ahead and do the free trial. Check it out. Do it for you know a week or two, whatever the length is they offer and see what you think. And if it's really paying off, then you know, have the answer, right? Okay, well, there's so many more emails here I want to get to, but I do want to take you behind the curtain at the Antiques Roadshow. And we will do that in just a moment with Diane Haddad from Family Tree Magazine. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any of all A line from my old mother Bring me a letter my it's here, the new version 5 of the award-winning Roots Magic Genealogy software. It makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easier and more enjoyable than ever. If you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've really been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, then do what I did. I chose Roots Magic, and I'm really glad that I did. Throughout its 10-year history, Roots Magic has helped people research and share their family trees with innovative features like uh, moving people from one file to another with your mouse a source wizard to help you document your work, creating a shareable CD to give to family and friends, and running Roots Magic off of a USB flash drive when you're away from home. Roots Magic also received the award for easiest to sync from Family Search for their work in interfacing with that system. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 5 at rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. I produce and host the Family Tree Magazine podcast, and I get a chance to talk to a lot of interesting people on that show as well. And of course, every episode each month, I get a chance to sit down and chat with Diane Haddad. She's the managing editor of Family Tree Magazine. She's also the genealogy insider blogger for Family Tree Magazine. Of course, we always spend time chatting about the kids and what's going on after our little um, podcast segments. And she told me about this really cool experience she had recently as 
PBS's TV show, The Antiques Roadshow, came to Cincinnati. And, of course, that's where the corporate headquarters of Family Tree Magazine is, and that's where Diane lives. And so she uh, got an opportunity to go there as part of the media. And I said, oh, okay, that's it. You're coming on my show because I know we have lots of listeners who enjoy and uh, feverishly watch the Antiques Roadshow to find out what the gems are out there that end up being worth a fortune. And she very kindly agreed. So here's my conversation with Diane Haddad. Hi, Diane. Hello. Diane, you and I were talking not long ago. We were recording an interview, of course, for Family Tree Magazine's podcast. Afterwards, we got done and and you were telling me about a really cool event that was coming up that you were going to get to go to. Tell everybody what that was. It was the Antiques Road Show appraisal event that they held in Cincinnati, which is where our magazine headquarters are and where I live. That's where they film all the appraisals that will appear on three episodes of Antiques Road Show next year. And that's on PBS, right? Yes. So it's actually three episodes, because I imagine that's a huge endeavor to put on an event like that. They held this at the same conference center that we went to NGS in 2012, right? They did. It took up two halls of the convention center. And that so place two is huge. Really big rooms, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was mostly lines. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the first things I wanted to ask. How many people really do end up attending? Is, is it just one day? It was just one day, um, I think scheduled for eight hours, but they tend to run over, you know, just as long as as they're still doing appraisals. They had a record number of people apply to get tickets. It's a free lottery that people enter. They give away 3,000 pairs of tickets. 6,000 people, and then each person is allowed to bring two items. Oh, fantastic. So that's, what is that, (laughs) 12,000 object appraisal? So you were talking about the lines. Is it just one big, long, snaking line, or do they kind of have it divided up? Well, it started out as like a triage line, and then each person after they stand in that line, and it's up to them to bring whatever sort of carrying method (laughs) for their antique. They don't provide help because they don't take the responsibility of handling people's personal right. objects. So then those people go through kind of a, an area where there's, there are generalists who are familiar with a lot of antiques. And then those people can give you a ticket for folk art or prints or whatever um, kind of object you have. I think there are something like 20 categories. And then you go stand in the line for that object. Okay. So another line. So And then they're kind of assessing who's going to move on to the higher level, right, as far as potentially being filmed for the show? Right. Those people and then also the um, appraisers, they catch sight of an object or if, you know, the person does bring the object up to their table and it ends up being very unique and interesting, then they'll go um, get a producer and say, hey, I think we should film this. And then the producer will decide yay or nay. And then at that point, the person who brought the object, they don't hear anything else about it because they want there to be actual surprise on camera. Oh, okay. So what, do they take the object aside and really do an in-depth evaluation? or? Mm-hmm. And that's the neat part that you don't see yeah. on TV is that I guess the appraiser goes online <laughs> to like, find <laughs> out, you know, what, what can I find out about this object? And then the owner of that object is in the green room and the press, because um, we were there as press um, visitors, we were not allowed to talk to anyone in the mm. green room. So that they didn't get wind of, you know, anything that might be going on with their... Right. Now, you mentioned that the people who bring their objects had to kind of handle it themselves. And I've seen people haul some pretty big stuff in there. Were there people who, like, had dollies and (laughs) crews trying to bring big pieces of furniture and that type of thing? There were dollies and carts and laundry (laughs) baskets and boxes and bags. I did find out after the event, I didn't know this before, but after the event, as I was going through some of the background they gave us, that for certain special pieces of furniture, they will send um, a truck and a crew to handle it and cart it to the convention center beforehand. Mm-hmm. So I guess sometimes you see those like great big high mm-hmm. boys or tables. And so it looks like they do provide special help for some of that well, stuff. So do they maybe um, submit it ahead of time in a picture or something to say this would be worthwhile? I yeah. Think so like when you find out about it. So did you bring ticket. anything? I did. I had, um, and I didn't know what it was called at the time. I just knew it was a wedding gift to my great grandparents, um, my mom's grandma, Mamie. And that was in 1908, they received this gift. It is a blue ruffle glass bowl inside a metal holder. So I I got 
expedited. I was fortunate not to have to wait in that long triage line, and then I even got to go to the front of the glass where Oh, the perks would be in the press. That, but it was a quick appraisal. I didn't take up much time. And it's called a bride's basket. It kind of looks and like it a basket, doesn't it? was from the Victorian it? era. Yeah, it does. It was Victorian, so the appraiser thought that it probably dated even before 1908. So I wonder if it's an heirloom from before that. It didn't have any mark or anything mm-hmm. on it, but he said that a lot of this silver would have been um, produced in New England, and then the manufacturer would like go you know, in different places to find the glass insert. And so did he tell you what he thought it was worth? I think he said maybe 200 It wasn't a lot. It wasn't 200,000, huh? (laughs) No, not enough to retire on, which is okay. And that was one of the things. I got to speak with the executive producer beforehand, and she was saying that people don't often want to sell, even if items are pretty valuable. It's an heirloom and they'll want to hang on to it. So they were more just curious about it but weren't planning on really selling Well, that's something that you notice a lot in the show is that there's so many family history backstories to these items, whether it's a really high value or a low value, it's just absolutely priceless to those people. Did did you talk to people in line? Did you hear some of those kinds of stories? We did. There was um, one of the cutest things. It was a 10-year-old boy who went with his mom, and he had a little glass panda bear figurine from his grandfather that he said it was worth $20 or something. (laughs) But he loved this object. Yeah. Loved it enough to bring it with them. There was a woman who had a lamp. It was a figurine of a woman with the lamp base. And then it had um, the shade on it. And it was something that her great aunt had brought back from Austria. And it was in her room when she was a little girl. And so something else that wasn't incredibly valuable, but just had a lot of sentimental value. Boy, you could almost have a whole um, Family History Roadshow sideline area (laughs) where people could Mm -hmm. come and just record their stories and that type of thing. Were there any items that really that you kind of heard or caught wind of that were just the big money numbers? I found out that a lot of the the media get to bring objects. There was a cameraman from our local paper who had brought some kind of Asian art Mm -hmm. objects. As soon as the appraiser saw him, he had been there that morning, so I didn't see these items. But he was whisked away to this <laughs> green room, and everyone was like, oh, my gosh. So I can't wait to watch the show and, and see that. Oh, so, so where um, are they filming the yeah, final thing? Do they really keep it secret th- from everybody there at the venue? The raising happens right in the middle of everything. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, on the show. surprised me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I guess you could listen, and they don't let they don't want people standing close because it can look awkward on right. film. So, like, they don't want you standing around looking you know, so that viewers could see you. <laughs> <laughs> gawking, but it is right there in the middle, so you see everyone standing in line in the background and kind of milling about. I imagine it's so pretty loud in there. Me. It's probably kind of hard to cock your ear and try and hear what they're saying. We um, saw a couple of praise appraisals taking place Mm -hmm. and then later on I was able to talk to one of those people it was an old daguerreotype camera that was worth it was worth a few thousand dollars wow and the person had and it wasn't an heirloom the person had found it in a a building that she inherited hopefully they'll put that on air and we can find out more about that oh yeah oh how fun oh gosh so you were were you there for just the whole day or did you just kind of jump in for part of it just an hour or two oh nice i had no idea what to expect or how long i would be there i had my mom there and i said probably three hours but it might go over i don't know or i might be home really soon <laughs> <laughs> just an hour and then i actually when i was going through those same materials later i saw that media visits are limited to an hour each because they provide you with an escort so i guess they only have you know resources for so oh, many sure. people to come visit sure. well, wow really fun one of the perks of uh working at family dream magazine it was so interesting it, the only thing that would have made it even better was to meet Mark Wahlberg. Did you see him wandering around? He's been there and gone. We we had our eyes open (laughs) for him, but didn't see him. That would have been priceless, right? Yeah. (laughs) So do you have any idea when the episodes are going to air from Cincinnati? They said early 2013. Early 2013. Okay. Yes. Oh, gosh. Let's look forward to We're going to have to keep our eyes peeled, see if we see Diane mingling around in the background and getting into <laughs> view on the camera, awesome. <laughs> carrying your bridal <laughs> basket, right? I know. So what do you do with the bridal and basket now? Where is it? I gave it back to my mom, and she has put it back on the shelves in her dining oh. room. Oh, 
I just feel extra motivation to find out about other, I mean, I didn't even know this thing existed. So to find out about what else there is and just make sure that those stories get passed on. Exactly. And somehow, you know, inventoried with the items so that they, they do kind of move on through the generations. How much fun. Gosh. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us about. You're um, welcome. Um, do you know how they announce the other venues? I'm sure people listening are thinking, oh, I wonder if they're going to come to my town. It's on the Antiques Roadshow website. Oh. They're finished filming for this year. They just finished in Seattle. I don't know exactly when they put up the venues for the next year, but I would keep an eye on it because um, you want to enter the lottery. You know, if they're coming anywhere near you and you want to go, you want to enter the lottery right away. Right. First come, first served. Okay. We'll have a link in the show notes to the Antique Roadshow website. And uh, Diane, thank you so much for joining us here on the show and sharing your experiences. How fun. You're welcome. It's been fun. Profile America, Tuesday, September 25th. Three important dates in American newspaper history occurred in September, spanning more than 200 years. On September 15th, 1982, USA Today began publishing. Critics at the time said the idea of a national newspaper was doomed to failure. Now, USA Today is one of the country's largest selling dailies. On September 18th, 1851, the New York Times issued its first edition. And on this date in 1690, the first newspaper in America was published for one day in Boston before being shut down by British authorities unhappy with its content. There are almost 1,400 daily newspapers published across the nation. Of these, over 900 have Sunday editions. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Interesting stuff on newspapers. Of course, if you want to learn more about how to find your family in newspapers, check out my book. And it's titled the same, How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers. It's available at my store at genealogygems.com. And the introduction music for that segment, it wasn't actually the PBS US version of Antiques Roadshow, but it was a remix of the Antiques Roadshow BBC series. The song is called Antiques Roadshow Remix. It's by an artist called The Elusive Mr. Hatchard, and it's available at soundclick.com. And there's a video version as well on YouTube. I'll have those links for you in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 141. Before we wrap up this episode, first of all, thanks so much to Diane Haddad for being here. And, you know, October is just around the corner. And in addition to being Family History Month, also it includes Halloween, correct? And I have been having so much fun with Pinterest. I don't know if you have checked out Pinterest. We're going to talk about it more in depth on an upcoming podcast episode and kind of what it can do for genealogy. I will have a link in the show notes to my Pinterest if you want to come check out and see what I've been pinning. Actually, a couple of things I came across that were just so interesting. Okay, from history, get this, a vampire hunting kit from the 1800s. You just have to see it. That's all I can say. um, The article here says travelers in the 19th century would purchase vampire hunting kits in preparation for their travels to Eastern Europe. The kits would contain a wooden stake, Bible, crucifix, pistol with lead bullets, gunpowder, garlic, and glass vials that held various concoctions to ward off vampires. These kits predated Bram Stoker's Dracula and other written accounts of vampires pointing to the strong oral history component of the undead bloodsucker. You got, you just got to see this thing. This is really interesting. Now I can't even guarantee you this is true. (laughs) I mean, who knows? It's from the PBH network, but it's pretty interesting. Anyway, if somebody put this together to make it look old, they did a really authentic job. Okay. So that's one thing for the history buff. And then the other item that I came across was from the Momtastic website. This is really fun. Okay, this is, I have an absolute penchant for uh, ball glass jars, you know, canning jars, ball and cur and that type of thing. And 
they did a really cool effect using stars. Now, this was focused on the 4th of July, adding 4th of July stars to these jars. But I got to look at it and I thought, this is like an alternative to the pumpkin, to the Halloween pumpkin. So take a look at it. I'll have it in the show notes for you. And this may just spawn some ideas for you for some really cool additions to the pumpkins on your porch. Maybe you could have some ball jar lanterns that um, maybe don't have stars on them, but have other kind of cool features. And you can use stickers to make these, these designs. So I'll have that for you as well. And of course, I just want to tell you, it's out. My new book, Turn Your iPad into a Genealogy Powerhouse. And um, <laughs> that it does. You'll be amazed what your iPad can do and your tablet. Lots of people have written me and said, hey, I've got like a Samsung tablet, an Android tablet. The book, while it's geared to the iPad, does focus as well on being of value to the Android tablet user. So as I go through the book and talk about the various apps that are really the top ones for using for genealogy, I'll have the alternative if it's available in the Google Play. Um, so you can go in and grab the app or an alternative app for the same kind of functionality. And of course, even though we do a lot of tips and tricks for the iPad, you'll also have a really good sense of what tablets are capable of. When you see what I'm talking about in terms of what the iPad can do, then you can go over to your tablet and look for that same feature. You can try it out yourself, see if it works. If it doesn't, go to the instruction manual for the tablets. But it was interesting. I taught the class recently and... Um, Gosh, there were a lot of iPad users. It's still the really popular one out there. But I think everyone will find it of value. And hey, the holidays are coming. You might be toying with the idea of asking Santa for a tablet or an iPad. And this book will go a long way to helping you really make that decision. And I just dare you not to want one after you read it. Boy, did I use my iPad constantly on my trip this weekend. Again, it's so light. I find myself not wanting to drag my laptop out of my rolling bag, but I just pop out the iPad and I can do pretty much anything that I'm able to do on my laptop. My goal is no more carrying the laptop. We'll see if I can get there. Anyway, the book is available now in my store at genealogygems.com. Just click store. And many, many of you have asked for the ebook version. We tried valiantly to get the ebook to be downloadable through the store. It ain't working. So there is a link at the top of the listing for the paperback version. That link will take you over to my store at lulu.com and the ebook version is there. So you can uh, check that out. It's one extra click, but you can head over to the Lulu store or if you've been there before, you know how to find it. You can certainly find it through the Genealogy Gems toolbar. And we've got ebook versions of all my books over there. So you can uh, check those out and get ready to hit the road. That's what's so cool. You know, I was telling the audience this weekend, we were talking about iPads, and I said, you know, it's interesting, we spent the last 10 years just really focused on how to do genealogy in our jammies, didn't we? <laughs> we didn't want to go anywhere. We've been um, having to hit the road every time we wanted to get information of, of a genealogical nature. And so it was just a breath of fresh air to be able to do so much research right from home in our jammies. But now, with the popularity of who do you think you are, boy, everybody's getting the itch to get out and really have their own family history experience on the road. So it's a, it's a great balance, isn't it? You can do so much of the legwork, if you will, online gathering documents. But then with that iPad in hand, you can hit the road and bring everything with you and really experience it for yourself. I think that's pretty cool. All right. Well, I think that wraps things up. So I want to thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.